get to be uh, do some of my DS work. And I haven't preached in over a month, so I apologize if we go long, because boy, I've been missing this. After 37 years of every Sunday morning having the same schedule going on. Oh, I forgot. I have to bring you official greetings from our Bishop uh, Scott Jones and all the extended cabinet, and we lift up our prayers for each of you and your ministry here. And wow, wait till I tell them you had 544 kids at Vacation Bible School. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. As United Methodists, we say we're out to make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I tell you what, 544 kids heard the story of Jesus Christ this week. You've done it. That's fantastic. I, I thank you and I applaud everything you've done. Now, when I was coming in here today, somebody said, asked me who I was, and if I was one of those uh, big wigs out of Kansas that come up to, to see you. And so I know you're probably not knowing what to expect from a district superintendent. So if I may, Jason, I'm going to borrow something from you. You know, district superintendents are kind of stuffy people. So uh, maybe I'll start today by uh, sharing with you one of the uh, one of the classics of the faith. And my apologies to all of you sitting in the back row. But this is one of those classic uh, church songs that for some reason has never made it into the hymnal. You'll understand why. Let me get a little more here. Sunday school is over, it's time to go to church. Just like a home and pigeon, back to my favorite perch. I'm sitting on the back row as far as I can be. The preacher and the choir with their introit sung and see. I got the Sunday morning sitting on the back row of the sanctuary blues. From the place I'm sitting, I get a perfect view of everything that's happening in every single pew. I see who is a listening, I see who falls asleep, and all the time I'm talking to the girl that's next to me. I got the Sunday morning sitting on the back row of the sanctuary blues. I daydream through the scriptures, the announcements and the song, of thinking about my date next week and who to ask along. And halfway through the morning prayer, I remember Friday night, the day to have the preacher's kid was really out of sight. I got the Sunday morning sitting on the back row of the sanctuary blues. The preacher gets excited, he starts to talk real loud, says something about somebody coming back on a cloud. Whatever he's a saying, it can't apply to me Cause I haven't missed a single week since 1963 Some people think that going to church is just a waste of time A time that could be better spent in the country club front nine Well church is not a waste of time, at least it's not for me I even wrote this song during the doxology I got the Sunday morning sitting on the back row of the sanctuary blues I got the Sunday morning sitting on the back row of the sanctuary blues. Well, thank you very much. My apologies to those of you sitting in the back row. And for all of you who might be preacher's kids, my apologies as well. I was really excited about coming here to Horizons because, see, my son... My oldest son, about uh, 10, 12 years ago, when he was a student at, uh, U at Wesleyan, used to come to Horizons. And I wanted to see the church that fed my son spiritually while he was out of my house. So thank you very much, uh, Horizons, for the impact you made on my son. He now lives in California, so he's not among you anymore today. And also, I was excited today because Jason said, you're going to do movies. I said, wow. And of course, Jason, knowing how old I am, he says, Bill, have you ever done, uh, you ever preached at movie clips? I said, yeah, I have, Jason. I've done that before. By the way, when you see Jason, show him this. Tell him. <laughs> and I think I've been wearing these longer than he has because I'm older than he is quite a bit. 
But you just let Jason know I was, I was in good shape here. And by the way, if things don't go the way you're expecting today, two excuses. First of all, I haven't preached in over a month. And second, I don't know exactly how you do things here. So we'll try and get through it any way we can. Most of you might have heard of me if you've, as director of the Nebraska United Methodist Num, uh, Bicycle Ride. It's called NUM. And uh, it's a ride I started uh, 19 years ago. I take 150 people on a bicycle tour to Nebraska for five days, and they pay me to go to, to see this great state. And then I take the, the profits from the ride, and I donate it for world hunger. And I'm very pleased at the end of the ride this year, uh, we've now donated $713,000 worth of food to people around the world. So... If any of you ride a bike, come see me. We'll, uh, I'll get you on the num ride next summer. We're heading out to Nebraska and a little bit of Colorado. Well, anyway, the movie. Oh, yes, I had to get back to the movie. I got to preach. Movie. He said, uh, Bill, have you ever seen the movie 42? I said, oh, fantastic movie. It is a great movie. But also, there's a great sadness when you see this movie. For me to think that during my lifetime, this evil of racism could show itself in the way that the world was and what our great country was like back in the 40s and the 50s and unfortunately even in the 60s and 70s and even today. Now in the movie, let me set up this clip a little bit for you. Uh, the manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers was a man named uh, Branch Rickey. And in the movie, they kind of there's a, a part where the, at the beginning where Branch Rickey says, you know, in baseball there's not white or black, there's also green. He's talking about money. He says, you know, I think if we had an African-American player for the Brooklyn Dodgers, then maybe African-American fans would come. Well, unfortunately, it made it look a lot like, like Branch Rickey was only concerned about money. But there's a lot more to Branch Rickey than just the money. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. If you want to give me this uh, clip uh, from uh, uh, 42, it's when he's trying to pick out who's going to be the perfect player to be part of the, the Brooklyn Dodgers. All right, then. Go on. Go on. You... Roy Campanella. Hell of a player. He's too sweet. They eat him alive. All right. I'll throw it. All right. Satchel Page, then. He's too old. We need a player with a future, not a past. Here. Jack Roosevelt Robinson. Four sport college man out of UCLA. That means he's played with white boys. Playing for the Kansas City Monarchs. 26 years old. He's batting 350. 350. Methodist. Commissioned Army officer. He was court martialed. He's a troublemaker. Oh, he argues with umpires. A quick temper is his reputation. Well, what was he court martialed for? Wouldn't sit in the back of a military bus. Fort Hood, Texas. Driver asked him to move back. <laughs> MPs had to take him off. Well, yeah, you see? I see he resents segregation. If he were white, you'd call that spirit. Robinson's a Methodist. I'm a Methodist. God's a Methodist. You can't go wrong. Find him. Bring him here. How are you, fellas? You know, I'm looking for your uh, shortstop. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know if I can go as far as say God's a Methodist, but uh, I love that line. Robinson's a Methodist, I'm a Methodist, and God's a Methodist. And because he's a Methodist, that's what influenced what he did. He uh, was looking for the perfect player, someone who was a, not only a good athlete, but someone who was strong in character, someone who could take all the ridicule and prejudice that he was going to face. 
dirty play. He liked Robinson. Robinson, he said, he went to UCLA, which you didn't know, a little known fact that UCLA back in this day was associated with the, the Methodist Church. So he says he went to UCLA, so he's played with, with white players before. And uh, Branch Rickey was a Methodist. He was a uh, baseball coach at Ohio Wesleyan University. And there's an incident there with a player named, uh, his last name was Thomas, that really influenced Branch Rickey's life. They were traveling to do a game, and they came to an overnight stay. And they came to the motel, and they wouldn't let this catcher on the team, Thomas, stay with the rest of the players in the motel. And Branch Rickey got into it with the manager of the motel. And finally, the manager gave in and said, well, we'll put a roll away in your room. And Branch Rickey made a pledge at that time, if ever. I can do anything to right this wrong. I'm going to do it. So in the 40s, Branch Rickey had to stage the platform position to make a difference that was going to change the world. He said, I'm going to bring a black player into Major League Baseball. We're going to cross the color line that, that no one has done before. And people advised him, he says, now, Mr. Ricky, don't do this. Do you realize what you're risking? I mean, you'll be an outcast. Nobody will come to the games. The other teams won't play. Your own team will rebel against you. The Branch Ricky said, no, this is right. We're going to do it. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if what you believed, if your faith was not just something you did, on Sunday morning. But what if your faith was something you lived every single day of the week? Can you imagine what that would do to this world? This world that we live in that is so much being influenced and run by those forces that are other than godly? What if we let our faith, if we're willing to risk who we were, our reputation, our wealth, on living out what it means to be a Methodist. It's not easy. Even the strongest Christians have a difficult time when they're asked to stand up and live out what it means to be a follower of Christ. I'd like to read to you a uh, scripture that uh, has kind of haunted me for much of my life. It comes from Matthew 5. When he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain. He sat down his disciples and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are you, when people insult you and persecute you, say all kinds of evil things about you falsely on account of me. I remember 42 years ago in August, I was a freshman in college, scared to death. I grew up in a little town called Pleasanton. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Pleasanton. It's about nine miles from Hazard. Anyway, <laughs> Pleasanton had a total population of 200 people. And here I was, a little tiny farm community boy going off to the big city and off to school. And I went into my first class. Intro to sociology. 
talk about being scared. Here I was in a lecture hall. I had more seats in it than there were people in my hometown. And people started coming in. I'm wondering, what's college going to be like? Now, this is a whole new experience for me. And it actually crossed my mind, how's my faith going to work? I remember what it did for me back in Pleasanton. I mean, I went to church all the time. I was in the youth group, all two of us in the youth group. But uh, they even let me uh, preach every now and then on Youth Sunday. I had a 50% chance of getting the job. <laughs> but I got into college, and I remember that first class. I sat down there, and I sat kind of near the back because I was kind of scared of what might happen here. And I was afraid, is everybody going to know I'm from Pleasanton and I really don't belong in this city with all these people? And the professor came in, and I all of a sudden knew things are different in college because he had a dog with him. And the dog was just, just free, and he introduced the dog to us. His name was Dr. Dog, and that's how he got to come in the classroom because he's a guest lecturer here at college. And he had a stack of books, and he set them down on the table. And on top, I recognized one book. You could see it from miles away. It was a Bible. No big deal. I grew up in Pleasanton. I used to have teachers who would start classes with prayer. I grew up in the time of Andy and Mayberry in Pleasanton. It was a fantastic time. So he had a Bible. Big deal. Well, the class started... He took out his Bible and he opened it up to that very passage I just read to you. And he started reading, Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are the meek. He closed it and he says, How many of you believe this crap? Whoa. This was not Pleasanton anymore. He says, You've come to college to make a lot of money and lord over other people. Do you really believe it's blessed to be poor? You've come here to be a big person when you graduate. Do you believe that you're going to be blessed if you're persecuted? Do you believe this stuff? And here I was sitting among 200 people, freshmen like myself. Probably a lot of them came from small towns just like I did. And we were scared to death. I remember there sitting there thinking, if I only had the courage, raise my hand and said, I believe that. But no. I thought, boy, if I do, what's everybody gonna think of me? I mean, they don't even know me yet. What a way to start off in college, look like some nerd from a little small town and I say, I believe in God, I believe in the Bible. I wasn't gonna do that. I mean, I had too much to risk. My reputation was on the line. I'm a freshman. I'll never forget what happened next. He took that Bible, he closed it, he says, that's what I thought. And he turned back towards the bulletin board, and then I'll never forget what he did next. He goes, Phew! backhanded that Bible across over the top of all of our heads in that lecture hall. And I'll never forget the sound when he hit the back wall and slid to the floor. What if? What if what we believed was not just what we did on Sunday morning? But what if it's what we lived and practiced every day of our life? What if we stood up for God in our neighborhoods, at work, in our families? in our city, in our world? What if we said, he's a Methodist, I'm a Methodist, God's a Methodist? What if we let our faith make a difference? And we read the paper, we look at the news, say, oh my goodness, this world is just falling apart. Why doesn't somebody do something? Well, you know, 
everyone God needs to make a difference in this world, they're here right now. And it's you, and it's me. What if we would risk our reputation, our wealth, our position in life? Imagine what a difference it'd make. Branch Rickey did it. Changed the world, one man. What is there, 120, 140 people in here today right now? Jesus just started off with 12. Look what they did. Imagine what we could do. We could change this world.